Hi guys, Dan here from Reptile Encounters. Thanks so much for joining us on our Reptile Encounters wild live stream and a big thanks to Knox City Council and Stringy Bark Festival for having us on board. Now here in Australia, we've got some of the most amazing wildlife on earth. Most of it, something like 83% of it is found nowhere else on earth. It's really special, it's really unique and we're really lucky to have it. Now we've got a big range of native wildlife for you guys to meet today. Extra special stuff. Stuff, and not for a great reason. These are threatened and endangered species. Now, we all know about things like tigers and polar bears and rhinos from all over other parts of the world, and we know why they're in danger. But when it comes to species here in Australia, a lot of people don't know what they are. And so one of my favorite parts of my job is introducing people to species that might live in their own backyard that they may never have heard of. And that includes some of our endangered species, because if we don't know what they are, we can't care about them. And if we don't care about them, how are we supposed to save them? And so today we're gonna to be meeting a bunch of species that are in trouble and talking about why they're in trouble and what we can do in our day in order to help them. Now this first animal today, his name is Roman. He's very excited to come and meet you guys. You might have already heard him. I'm gonna pop over here and grab him for you. Come here, buddy. Yep, step up, there we go. Now, this is Roman, and Roman is a red now these guys get their name from their beautiful black plumage and on their tail, those beautiful red bars. Now these guys live in the dry parts of Australia and there's actually five different types of red-tailed black cockatoo, what we call subspecies. Now subspecies aren't different enough to be their own species, but they're different enough that we can tell them apart. Some are bigger, some are smaller, some live in the forest, some live in the desert. Now, Roman here is part of a subspecies we call Escondidas. That's their Latin name. And that's a brand new subspecies we only just found out about from over in Western Australia. And they're considered threatened. But here in Victoria, we have our own subspecies called the Southeastern Red-Tailed Black Cockatoo, which is a bit of a mouthful, or their Latin name, Graptogyne, which is even harder to pronounce. They are critically endangered. In fact, there's only estimated to be between 12 and 1600 of them left in the wild. They're only found in the Mallee over in Western Victoria and on the border of Vic and South Australia. The reason their numbers have dropped so much is because of habitat loss. They have lost a lot of the places that they like to live. Being the smallest of the subspecies, they really don't like coming out of the forest very often. They're exposed to predators. They won't really feed down on the ground like some of our other red-tailed blacks will. And so we have cut down a lot of the bushier parts of the mallee to make room for all the agriculture going on out there. When we've removed all of that forest, they've lost where they live, they've lost where they feed, and they've lost where they nest. See, they're quite picky with their foods, and they only like to eat from certain trees like bull oaks and acacias. And when we've cut down lots of those trees, they've lost their food. Not only that, but like I said, they have lost where they nest. These guys need tree hollows. They love to nest in big hollows in big old gum trees. And unfortunately, most of those trees have been cut down. It takes over a hundred years for some of those nest hollows to start to form. And by the time they're big enough for red-tailed blacks to use, they can be much closer to 200. Now, even the ones that are left, most of them are dead and three to 4% of them are falling over because of natural causes every year. And so to try and help them, we have started using nest boxes out in the Mallee. And we've also started to get farmers on board. And there's certain um, money that they can get from their local councils if they plant food trees. Because again, loss of food is just as big an issue as loss of nest sites. Now, Roman here, he absolutely loves his almonds. You've got one in your hand and you're going for another one already. He is a funny boy. And luckily for red-tailed black cockatoos, they're actually quite well known. And so when the species is well known, it's a lot easier to talk about them and get people on board. We have to be much uh, better with our farming practices to make sure that we don't run out of food for these guys, as well as helping groups like the Red-Tailed Black Cockatoo Organization who go out and monitor these guys. They do surveys every single year to make sure that we, we know how many of them there are. And at last count, there was something like 1,283 which is amazing and hopefully means the species is on the rise because the time they counted before, it was, wasn't even 900. That's a good sign that we're doing the right thing, but we've got to keep it up.
Now I am going to pop Roman back. We are going to meet another species, a less known species that used to be found in the Mali, but sadly isn't even found on this side of the country anymore, which is a bit of a shame. Now, you come out from over here. This next species is a mammal. I know we're called reptile encounters, but we've got other stuff too. And this is a species a lot of people don't know. Have any of you guys ever heard of a betong? A lot of people haven't. And there's actually a whole bunch of species of betongs. They are a mammal, they're a marsupial, which means they've got a pouch. And in here is my beautiful girl, Ella. Here she is. Ella is what we call a brush-tailed betong. They also get called a woily, which is their indigenous name. They also get called rat kangaroos, which I think is a bit mean. They're not a rat, and technically they're not a kangaroo, but they are in the same family. They are macropods, just like kangaroos and wallabies. And you can see she's got big feet that she uses for hopping around. These guys can actually hop about a kilometre and a half each night looking for their favourite foods, leaves, grasses, fruits, and mushrooms. They love eating mushrooms. Now, once upon a time, the brush-tailed betong was actually the most common and widespread land mammal in Australia. They were found from the coast of WA right across to the western slopes of the Great Dividing Range. They were found throughout a whole bunch of habitats, but they were all dry and open. Those dry, open woodlands, grasslands, and mallee helped these guys to thrive, and they were in huge numbers. With the exception of a few of our little micro bats that fly around everywhere, we don't really see them, these guys were everywhere else. Now, sadly, from being found on 60% of the mainland, they are now found on less than 1%. And unfortunately, that's for a couple of reasons. Number one is habitat loss again. This is one we're going to keep talking about a lot today. They have lost a lot of their habitat to agriculture, cities, towns, schools, and pools. And they don't like living in those places. They like living on those native dry grasslands. As we've lost them, we've lost these species. Here in Victoria, we've lost over 99% of our native grasslands. And so the species from those grasslands, like the brush-tailed betong, as well as species like the plains wanderer, the striped legless lizard, and the eastern hooded scalyfoot have all become really, really endangered here as well. It's really sad. Now, the other reason these guys are in trouble is introduced species. This is another one we're gonna mention a few times today. Things like rabbits and hares and even goats eat a lot of the food that these guys do. And things like cats and foxes really like to eat them. In the last few hundred years, half of the mammal extinctions on Earth have been in Australia. We've lost something like 35 species. In Northern Victoria alone, we've lost about 18. And most of them are about the size of Ella here. This is what we call the critical weight range, which means the size that's perfect for feral cats and foxes. Now, it's not just feral cats that cause problems. It's also pet cats. And in areas where there's lots of people, like the suburbs, pet cats can actually do more damage because they'll live in higher densities. So one of the best things that you can do to look after our wildlife is if you've got a pet cat, and there's nothing wrong with having a pet cat, keep it inside, especially at night, or build a cat run or a catio for them to go out and explore and get the fresh air. Because even the average well-fed house cat kills between five and 30 animals every single night, even if they don't eat them, because it's their instinct. And our animals didn't evolve with foxes and cats. They don't know how to get away from them. And so we need to be able to protect our native wildlife. Even around the suburbs, in places like Knox, there's possums and sugar gliders and blue tongues and bugs and spiders and skinks and lots of little birds that cats will prey on. So if you can keep your cats inside 24-7, that is one of the best things you can do to protect our native wildlife. Now, sadly, we don't have brush-tailed bedongs in Victoria in the wild anymore. But in some places, including in New South Wales, we've been able to release them in the wild into special predator-proof pens. Big areas of National Park with a special fence around them to keep out the foxes, keep out the cats. And this gives them a great chance at survival. There's only about 15,000 of them left in the wild. And until we can do something about the foxes and the cats, it might not get much higher. But they breed well in captivity. So hopefully we'll never lose these beautiful, very special little Aussie battlers. Now I'm going to pop Ella back. We're going to meet our next animal. This one is cold-blooded or ectothermic, which is a better word to use. They get the heat from outside their body, but it's not scaly just yet. This one is an amphibian. And we've only got one group of amphibians native to Australia. So write in the comments, what is the only group of amphibians that we have here in Australia? 
and I'll go get it. Let's have a look over here. Now, my next animal, or two animals actually, are frogs. These are Gary and Jerry, and Gary and Jerry are what we call growling grass frogs. Hopefully you can see them in this tank. It gets a little bit hard sometimes. Now, growling grass frogs should be a really common species around Melbourne. They are found in a bunch of places around Melbourne. In fact, a few places close to you guys. Now, they used to be found through the entire southern corner, the southeastern corner of Australia, from just over the border into New South Wales and found right through Victoria and a little bit into South Australia as well. They're quite a large frog. They are actually a cousin of the green tree frog and they don't really climb anymore. They spend all their time in and around the water's edge, hiding in the plants and under the vegetation. They croak, they call from the vegetation in the water and they sound like a motorbike changing gears. They go, rap, 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 rap. Really similar to a dirt bike. It's quite concerning hearing thousands of those in the middle of the night. You think the bikes are coming to get you. It's growling grass frogs. And they eat everything from bugs to little yabbies, things like fish in the water. And their favorite food is actually other frogs, smaller frogs, even smaller members of their own species. They'll be cannibals. Now, they used to be very common, but sadly, they've disappeared from something like 90% of the places they used to be found. 90%. The reasons why? Well, we've talked about them. Habitat loss. Lots of those rivers and streams and waterways that run through our grasslands where they like to live, we have cut down all the plants, gotten rid of all the reeds and things to open up the water and make it look pretty, and then we build our houses along it. And lots of their housing estates in the outer suburbs of Melbourne would have had lots and lots of these guys around, and now the habitat has all been changed. These guys actually bask in the sun like blue tongues and they'll sit in the reeds and the bulrushes to get their sun during the day. We clear away all that vegetation. These guys end up sitting out in the open and then not only do they get picked off by native predators like birds of prey, ibis, herons and storks, they also get picked off by, guess what? Foxes and cats. And so again, introduced predators are a big problem as well. Now these frogs are really, really mobile as well. They actually like to be able to move from one waterway to another. And they can move over a kilometre in a 24 hour period. This means that they could move between creeks. But now there's not just grassland or forest in between those creeks. They've also got to deal with houses, roads, cars, dogs and cats, people stepping on them, lots of hazards. And they don't move as well as they used to. And this impacts on their breeding. The last risk to these guys that we're going to talk about, there's plenty more, is a disease. We've been hearing the word pandemic a lot this year, haven't we? It's actually getting kind of hard to hear. These guys have been dealing with a pandemic since the 1980s. Amphibians all over the world dealing with a horrible disease called chytridiomycosis. Say that five times fast. We call it chytrid fungus because it's a little easier to understand. And it's a fungal infection that infects their skin. They use their skin to breathe. They use their skin to drink. Amphibians use their skin for a lot of things. Skin is really important to have. And what they'll do when they get this disease is that their skin won't work the way it used to and they end up dying. When their skin goes downhill, so does the rest of their health. Chytrid has already led to the extinction of four Australian frog species. There's another 10 that are at high risk and it spreads through the water and by frogs coming into contact with each other. Now, we know these guys like to live in and around the water for their entire lives. Why would they be coming into contact with other frogs? We talked about it before. You can write it in the comments. But this means that they are extra susceptible. They eat them. And a sick frog is a lot easier to catch than a healthy frog. If they catch a little frog that's got that disease, they get sick and they die. Now, we breed lots of them in captivity. These two were born at Melbourne Museum. And the Amphibian Research Centre down in Pearstar breeds lots of endangered frogs as well. But we can't start releasing them into the wild yet because, unfortunately, if we do that, we end up with a whole bunch of frogs getting chytrid and dying anyway. We've got to put a lot more effort into protecting these frogs and learning about chytrid. They have survived five mass extinctions. Amphibians, they've been around for millions and millions and millions of years. And this disease, in a matter of decades, could end up wiping out most of them. This isn't good. One of the best things you can do at home to look after frogs is put your stuff in the right bin. Pollution has a big impact on our frog species when it ends up in waterways. They're what we call environmental indicators. So if there's any chemicals in the water, 
Frogs are the first ones to get sick. And with these guys already being threatened, it means that we need to stop, take a moment, and put stuff in the right bin and not pollute. Not let chemicals go in the wrong directions and things like that, because that is how we end up with even less frogs. Now, I'm going to pop Gary and Jerry, our growling grass frogs, away. And now, we're going to meet a reptile. A Victorian reptile that doesn't have any legs. This is my mate, Vinny. And Vinny is called a Victorian carpet python. We do have pythons here in Victoria. In fact, we've got two species. Right over the far eastern tip, we get diamond pythons. And up along the Murray River, we get Victorian carpet pythons. Now, they're actually found right up through the Murray-Darling Basin. So a little bit into South Australia, the top of Victoria, through New South Wales, and into Queensland. In the northern parts of their range, they can get to two and a half metres long. They're very, very common, and they love living around farms where they can eat lots of rats, and farmers like having them around, and rightfully so. Here in Victoria, they tend to be a bit smaller. In fact, it's very rare to find a Victorian animal over about 1.7 metres. Now, the problem with that is that they want to stay hidden more because they're smaller, just like our red-tailed black cockatoos. And as we have cleared most of the river red gums from and that forest up along northern Victoria, it means we have lost a lot of the places where these guys like to live. So habitat loss is a big problem. Now, not only has it been lost, but now they have to deal with habitat fragmentation. Yes, there's still river red gum forests along the Murray River, but there's some here, there's some here, there's some way over here. And they're not going to travel in between because in between there could be hundreds of kilometres of open farmland. They don't like being in the open for that long. And so unfortunately, they won't travel. They may as well be stuck on islands in the middle of the ocean. They won't travel. And this can lead to problems like inbreeding because there may only be a few pythons in each part of the forest. Now on top of that, their habitat has been changed. Collecting firewood has a big impact on these guys. They need big hollow logs because that's where they lay their eggs. The girls will actually wrap around their eggs in a hollow log and shake their bodies just like this. And that keeps the eggs warm. They incubate their eggs. And they also need branches that have half fallen out of the trees in storms and they use them like ladders. And these python ladders let them get up into the canopy and access places where their food might be, like birds and possums. Now, Remember how I said a lot of our mammals in Victoria have gone extinct? All those little betongs and bandicoots and potteroos, once upon a time, would have been food for these guys, but they're gone. And now they rely on animals like rabbits. But rabbits are an introduced pest. They're a problem, and they do lots of damage to the environment. But if we get rid of rabbits, species like Victorian carpet pythons and wedge-tailed eagles, they end up losing a major food source as well as the cats and foxes, who will then prey even more on our native species. So it's a bit of a headache trying to figure out exactly what we're going to do. But nothing is not the right answer. Now, if you camp responsibly and you don't leave rubbish and things around in northern Victoria and you don't go burning every log and branch that you see, you can help protect the little parts of their environment that they need. Bring hot locks and stuff with you that you can burn. And that means you don't have to rely on clearing their native habitat. Be very responsible with your firewood collection if you are. Now I'm going to pop Vinny away and we're going to get at our last animal. Our last animal is a success story. He's not endangered anymore. But in the 1950s and 60s, we actually nearly lost them. And they are the largest reptile on earth. Do you know what that is? Write it in the comments while I get him out. What's the biggest reptile on earth? Let's see what I can find. All right, you. This is Charlie. And Charlie is a saltwater crocodile. Did you guess that correctly? I'll have to have a look. Now, saltwater crocodiles are considered common. But once upon a time, they weren't. And that's a bit interesting to hear, isn't it? The largest reptile on earth, one that we're so familiar with, being in that much trouble. Now, what happened is that we hunted them. In the 90s, 50s, and 60s, we hunted a lot of saltwater crocodiles. We hunted them for their meat and for their leather. And we hunted the big ones. Remember, this is not full grown. A saltwater crocodile can get to well over seven meters long. In fact, the biggest one ever measured was 8.11 meters. Not only that, it weighed a thousand kilos. That's a big animal. And hunters go for the biggest animals. More meat, more leather, more money. Now, that's not the way that predators work. Predators pick off the sick and the weak. And so the opposite effect was happening. Normally, these guys are the top of the food chain. And by hunting the sick and the weak, 
they help to keep their prey species, like kangaroos, at a reasonable level. Now, unfortunately, with the crocodiles being hunted, they, in the wild, started getting sickly and weaker because all the big healthy animals were being killed. By the end of the 1960s, we were down to about 3,000 saltwater crocs. Did you know they were that endangered? How crazy is that? Luckily, at the end of the 1960s, between 1968 and 1972, they became protected in Queensland, the Northern Territory, and Western Australia, right up the top in the Kimberley where they're found. Throughout Southeast Asia, where saltwater crocodiles are found as well, they weren't protected in time. And in lots of places like Thailand and Vietnam, they actually became extinct in the wild. Now, their numbers have slowly started to come back up. They do have a lot of babies, and the number one predator of young crocs is actually bigger crocs. So without that many bigger crocs eating them, their numbers could come up relatively quickly. Nowadays, we think that there's about 100,000 of them across the top end of Australia, which seems like a lot. But we think that over the course of their hunting, it was actually about 300,000 crocodiles that got hunted. So we may only be about a third of the way back to where they're supposed to be. Not only that, but in Queensland, they're actually still listed as near threatened. And Queensland tends to get up and say, oh, there's too many crocodiles, we need to control them. There's some uh, politicians that like to say things like that. We won't get into the politics too much, I promise. But we've got to remember, this is not the case. They still need to be protected. Big crocs eat little crocs. So it's very, very hard to have too many crocodiles. Now, these guys are a success story. We did get them back from the brink. But if we start hunting them again, and they end up on the endangered list for the second time in 50 years, is it going to show that we've learned anything? No. So hunting them is probably not a great idea. We need to protect all of our endangered species. The cute and fluffy ones, the scaly, scary ones, and the big toothy ones. Doesn't matter whether they give us a little bit of fear or not. They are incredibly important. All of them. This is an apex predator. We need them. Incredibly important in their ecosystem. We don't want them to become endangered again. Now, Charlie was our last animal today. I'm going to quickly pop him over here, back where he's supposed to be. Now, my name is Dan. I'm from Reptile and Kenneth. Thanks so much for joining us today. Make sure you check us out on Facebook and on uh, Instagram, we can see all the photos. This time of year, we get lots of babies and we have lots of live streams going on all the time as well. All the content that comes up on our Facebook, as well as check out zooflix.com. Exciting new venture with heaps of zoo related content, videos, podcasts, and lots more coming. Hopefully, we'll be able to start coming out and visiting you guys in person before long with all of our animals. We'll be able to see them, hear them, touch them, smell them every once in a while as well. But until then, make sure you wash your hands, wear your masks, be nice to our wildlife. And thanks so much again to Knox City Council and Stringy Bark Festival for having us. My name's Dan. I'll see you really soon.